the internet is flooded with the others and no surprise they are probably the cutest thing you could ever think of. They hold paws when they sleep and wrap themselves up in kelp to stop drifting out to sea. And they have a loose patch of skin under their armpit to store their favorite rock. I have found a sea otter live stream and a sea otter in a Jedi robe on Twitter. But out of all content, the one that grabbed me the most was this historic film. It's from the 1970s. Here, sea otters are being captured, back in the wooden boxes and then dropped off by aircraft thousands of kilometers away. You might be asking yourself, why on earth is the Atomic Energy Commission making films about sea otters? At least, this was the question that popped into my head. Well, they had a very good reason indeed. In the late 1960s, the AEC was testing nuclear bombs on Amchitka Island. And Amchitka was exactly the place where the otters from the video had come from. Back then, Amchitka had the biggest sea otter colony in the North Pacific. But otters weren't the only inhabitants of the island. Amchitka had been part of the Aleutians National Wildlife Refuge since 1913 and was home to walruses, sea lions, seabirds and more. Because of the island's rich biodiversity, the AEC was facing very real pressure at home and abroad to discontinue nuclear testing. But then US President Richard Nixon wanted to continue nuclear testing on the island. In fact, he wanted to detonate the largest underground nuclear bomb ever, codenamed Kanekin. The AEC needed to convince the public that their activities were safe and beneficial to society. But this decision-making was extremely controversial and anti-war and environmental activists started organizing themselves. This meeting led to the formation of an environmental organization you surely know very well. The activists feared that the explosion could trigger a mass mortality event among the island's wildlife, environmental contamination or even earthquakes. Side note, Amchitka is one of the most tectonical unstable places in America. As political and public concerns got bigger and bigger, the Atomic Energy Commission started producing short propaganda films, like this one with happy otters. As this still wasn't enough, they finally said, okay fine, we will fly scientists to Amchitka to study the potential impacts of the death on the local otter population. And that's when James Estes enters the picture. Estes had just completed his master's degree at Washington State University in 1969. At that time, the country was in the middle of the Vietnam War. Estes needed to prepare to join the military. But to his surprise, he flunked the physical exam because of a minor instability in his knee, an old baseball injury. These unexpected circumstances allowed him to apply for the AEC job in Amchitka. He hadn't worked with sea otters before, but he would give it a try. And so, in the 1970s, the young scientist hopped on a plane and began a unique scientific journey. Spoiler, Estes' work was groundbreaking. He not only analyzed the impact of the Kanekin test, but also highlighted the ecological role of top-level predators. And he provided the basis for today's understanding that sea otters are mitigating negative climate effects. In 1970, when he first set foot on the Alaskan island of Amchitka, James Estes was greeted by an ocean filled with furry faces. Everywhere the young biologist looked, there were sea otters, hanging around on kelp beds, shelling sea urchins, exchanging their signature squeals. Back then, crowds of these charismatic creatures were everywhere. For Estes, an intensive year of research lay ahead in the perfect natural lab. Amchitka is the southernmost link of the Aleutian island chain that swings across the Bering Sea from North America almost to the Russian coast. The island lost its native Aleut population in the 19th century. During World War II, it was used as an airfield by US forces to fight off Japanese troops. By the way, if you search on Google Earth, you can still see the airfield, although more than half of the island is blurred. Some people suspect that this has something to do with its nuclear testing history, because in the late 1960s, the US Atomic Energy Commission decided to use the infrastructure left behind by the military and test the latest nuclear bombs on Amchitka. These consecutive events led to James Estes being sent to the island to study sea otters. Back then, the Aleutian Island chain provided the perfect conditions for sea otter research. The population had just started to recover from the fur trade of the 18th and 19th century, which wiped out about 
99% of the animals. Originally, sea otters range around the North Pacific coast, from the north of Japan to the west coast of California. They were hunted intensively for their dense coats until 1911, when both sea otters and seals were given protection under the International Fur Seal Treaty. But by that time, only a few healthy pockets of the species had survived. And this was what Estes observed when he arrived on the Aleutian Islands. In some places, there were lots of otters. In others, there were a few, and in still others, otters were totally absent. He studied the mammals on and offshore. When diving off the coast of Mchitka, he found lush kelp forests, which the local sea otters called home. But when he visited Atu, a neighboring island, he discovered a completely different pattern. Here, the ocean floor looked totally different. Estes saw thousands of urchins painting the seabed purple. There were no otters and almost no kelp. It was a total contrast to what he knew from Anchitka. And that was the moment when he took a completely new direction in his research. It became clear in an instant. Where the sea otters had disappeared, the underwater world had become an underwater desert. But where otters were still present, so too were kelp forests and other species like fish, crabs, snails, seals and many more. And all that has to do with the sea otter's appetite. Sea otters are the only marine mammals that don't have a thick layer of blubber. Instead, they rely on a very dense fur coat and an incredibly impressive metabolism. They need to eat a quarter of their body weight daily. That means adults will consume 8 to 10 kilograms of shellfish a day. Luckily, their favorite food is sea urchins. A single sea otter can scarf down nearly thousand sea urchins in one day. For their size and how cute they are, they are aggressive eaters. They eat them like popcorn. Sea urchins are the dominant herbivore in their environment. They are small and spiky and multiply rapidly. And just like sea otters, they are voracious eaters. They use their sharp teeth to literally mow through kelp forests. They cut off the kelp where it's attached to the ground. The rest of the kelp string then rises to the ocean surface where it washes ashore. It's estimated that 95% of all kelp forests have been lost to these sea urchins. And based on Estes' research back in the 1970s, today's scientists believe that the only way to bring the kelp forests back is to bring back the sea otters too. These highly social mammals are the only ones that keep the urchins in check since their main predator, the sunflower sea star, was wiped out by a disease. James S. the sea otter urchin kelp system has become a classic example of a top-down predator controlled trophic cascade. It shows the importance of marine mammals that act not just as predators but as protectors, maintaining biological balance through their appetites. Sea otters significantly reduce the population of sea urchins and they also change their behavior. If otters are present, sea urchins seek shelter in caves and rocky areas, also feeding on scraps and detritus, not just on kelp. This behavior allows kelp forests to regenerate, oxygenate the ocean and store carbon dioxide. Where sea otters have returned, the kelp forests haven't just grown back, but are flourishing, growing up to 60 centimeters per day. That's the size of my dog. Also, sediments can stabilize and a healthy and diverse ocean floor provides shelter for fish, krill, seals, dolphins, and many more. The entire ecosystem stabilizes and the kelp forests became an important carbon sink. Kelp forests are one of the most efficient absorbers of CO2. They absorb up to 20 times more carbon by acre than terrestrial forests. Counted together, the world's kelp forests can suck in more carbon than the UK emits in a single year. When that kelp dies and sinks, the sequestered carbon can be harbored on the sea floor for millions of years. That's why many scientists see sea otters as a natural and adorable <laughs> way to combat climate change. But sea otters are struggling. Since being hunted almost to extinction because of the fur trade, they have been able to regenerate in only a few pockets of the historic range. Today, it's estimated that even on the Aleutian Islands, where Estes saw once so many furry faces, more than 90% of the sea otters are gone. The reason for this isn't clear yet, but a team around Estes observed that orcas had been changed their behavior, probably initiated by industrial whaling. Why? Well, industrial whaling whaling decimated the number of grey whales, the orca's main food source, and so they turned to other sea creatures, like sea otters instead. The loss of the sea otters is more than cosmetic, because as a keystone species, otters hold the entire ecosystem together. 
talking about ecosystem. What happened with the sea otters of the 1970s that were trapped and flown off Anchitka Island? Although there had been protests, President Richard Nixon insisted on the Kennekin shot. On November 6, 1971, the massive 5 megaton bomb was backed inside a 1,800 meter deep shaft and fired. Kennekin generated a seismic shock measuring 7.0 on the Richter scale. The island broke into two parts. Bonds, lakes and dirt soared into the air as high as 7 meters. Cliffside fell into the sea. Estes and his colleagues reported that 900 to 1100 sea otters had been killed in the shockwave. But at least a few individuals had been translocated before the nuclear bomb exploded. Into the friendly water. Half a century later, a few of these otters have burgeoned into healthy, sustaining populations. You could say Estes' work was ahead of its time. In the 1970s, the relationship between sea otters and kelp forests wasn't acknowledged to be an important weapon against climate change. Today, it's more important than ever. A sea otter comeback is both good for the marine ecosystem and also for combating our changing climate. By the way, Amchitka is still being monitored for any leakage of radioactive materials. And the island is slated to become a restricted access wildlife reserve in 2025.